I'm David Adamson. I work for British Standards as a lead standards development manager. And uh, it is a pleasure to be here to introduce this session to you, to work with Duncan and Rick. And um, I should mention that there will be Q&A. The Q&A uh, toolbar, as usual, uh, is available for you. Please use it during the session. Please don't use the chat because no one will be monitoring the chat really. So it's a Q&A that we want to, want to use. So do a couple of bios first off. Uh, professor Duncan Shaw, he is a professor in operational research and critical systems at the University of Manchester, where he works in the Humanitarian and Conflicts Response Institute. His interests include social and decision-making aspects of disaster planning and response, including community resilience. Duncan is also a convener of ISO TC292, Security and Resilience, Working Group 5, Community Resilience. Sorry for all these acronyms, but I know there's some people who are, uh, they, they, they don't mind and it. it can be very useful to have uh, a little more detail. Rick is our second speaker, Rick Cudworth, Partner, Advisory Services at Deloitte. Rick has spent the last 25 years of his career advising organizations in the private and public sector in dealing with crises and enhancing organizational resilience. He was responsible for leading the global response to the H1N1 pandemic in 2009, and was also a member of the Cabinet Office Business Advisory Network for Pandemic Flu. Now, Rick is the chair of the BSI Committee CAR1, Continuity and Resilience, and he's also a principal expert at ISO TC 292 Working Group 2. And this is the Organizational Continuity and Resilience. So Rick and, and Duncan are clearly experts in resilience, but approaching it from different perspectives. Uh, Duncan more so the community and, and Rick the, the organizational. And, and both have valuable roles in bringing standardization in this area to the global community. And we, and we can see this by their work, just how uh, influential they've been uh, in, in standards. For example, Rick, he is the, um, he's currently working with the ISO group on the study group on 22316 on organizational resilience. Uh, this has some work to do. It may be years before that comes to fruition, but uh, he's playing his part there. But more current, he's working on a revision of BS 65,000 organizational resilience. And that's starting in November. Uh, he's, he's pairing up there with um, Robert McFarlane of the, of the cabinet office. So together they're leading that work. And that'll be one to watch uh, because the uh, 65,000 laid out uh, the core concepts of, 60, or of resilience. But with this next revision, we look forward to seeing what, what those uh, gentlemen come up with. Uh, Duncan has also been extremely influential uh, in the, the ISO community especially. Uh, he has done, uh, for instance, 22395. Uh, 22395 is supporting vulnerable people in, in emergencies and crises. And uh, 22319, spontaneous volunteers, the involvement of spontaneous volunteers. So, so uh, by the way, I should mention that these standards that I've just mentioned and more, they were made available, freely available by BSI at the outset of the COVID. Um, March, April, and due to their popularity and the uptake and the usage by, by the UK, uh, there's an extension. So they're going to be available until the end of this year. So freely done, loadable. A lot of people have done it, and uh, we hope you continue to do that because um, it helps to build back better, if you will, or to recover from COVID. Uh, they can be found if you Google uh, BSI response to COVID-19. Um, BSI response to COVID-19 brings you to a page, you have to just give a couple of details, and then you have the categories of uh, subjects that you may be interested in downloading. A couple of hints and very valuable hints. When you download it, you cannot open it from your browser. There's an instruction there that says actually, uh, save to file. Most people ignore that, including myself. And so they come up with this, can't open it, there's an error message. So you have to save it. Once you download it, you have to save that file before you can view it. And the other hint for Mac users especially, you, you do need to open it using Adobe Acrobat Reader DC. So that DC is important there. So enough of the preamble. To get into the um, 22393, Community Resilience Recovery and Renewal. I just got a few slides here that I wanted to show you 
in addition to what Duncan is going to present. This standard was approved in September, uh, mid-September, and it's on a two-year timetable. And that's, that's good for ISO. Uh, those people working on ISO know it's usually three, ish year. So the, you know, it's important to get this out in a timely manner. And Duncan is the, the person to do that. He has a great track record of doing so. He's already come up with a working draft, working with his uh, global peers and colleagues and partners. So I'm confident this will be a very successful standard in the time frame that we need it. It will be guidance. It won't be used for certification. It's not a requirement standard. It's guidance. It'll be a framework for recovery. Frameworks usually include the, uh, the definitions, the principles, the processes, uh, not a management system, however, framework. And then those are the two bullet points. I think I'd be um, digging into what Duncan's going to tell you, uh, but shorter term activities and longer term activities are covered. Now, the, these is a little bit of a, an appeal for participants that in the UK, we need to mirror the ISO work. So I'm looking for members uh, to join the group that's going to be responsible for providing the input into the ISO work. SSM1, Societal Security, this is chaired by uh, Robert McFarlane, already mentioned. Um, but um, we, So we have the support of the Cabinet Office in this. But we've also had support, terrific support from other technical committees. Uh, the chairs, for instance, Russell Price from Risk Management, the Governance Group, David uh, Smith, and the uh, Continuity and Resilience Course, Rick uh, Cudworth, as I mentioned. So it, we need to populate that group, though, to make it um, really a solid, solid input, because BSI quite often, people rely on BSI to provide that kind of, especially it's our proposal. So we really want to provide expertise uh, into this group, this ISO group. So UK, we're looking for nominated representatives of, of our organizations, government, professional bodies, trade associations, professional associations, academia, charities, public interest groups, as well as interest, uh, individual experts. Uh, individual experts always play a very valuable role. And, um, and we appreciate all of that, those participations uh, from those members. So uh, and thank you to all our, our committee members quickly uh, to say that now. So if you are interested, please do contact me. I'm David Adamson at bsigroup.com. With just a brief, uh, I'd like to know more about this. I think I could contribute. Okay, so having said those things, I'll, I'll uh, ask Duncan. I'm now going to advance this now to your slide, Duncan, and I shall stop viewing myself and over to you, please. Thank you, Dave. Um, so welcome everybody and thank you for attending this session. Uh, Dave, can I just check that you can hear me? I can hear you fine, thanks. Thank you. So today I'm going to talk about a new standard, uh, ISO 22393. It's called recovery, but a lot of the work that we're doing is around recovery and renewal. And so I want to talk a little bit about that and the distinction and what this, this standard will draw out. Uh, important to note that this um, project that is leading to this work has been funded by UKRI and I'm very grateful to them for their support. Next slide, please, Dave. So this project came around because we were doing a lot of work at the very beginning of COVID, working with local authorities, working with national groups and trying to understand what it was that they needed by way of support. And they wanted some um, to understand what international lessons were there on COVID. So we put together what we call the Manchester Briefing. And this is a fortnightly document that we share to about 52,000 people through a network of partners, BSI being one. And we contain in that a whole series of lessons that organisations, local governments, community groups can be inspired by. And the, the, the notion of this standard is bringing together all of these lessons to understand how can a country, how can a local authority, how can an organisation recover from covid and put in place what they want to be for the next few years and so forth. So how can they develop plans and develop um, renewal um, strategies to take their organisation forward and to recover from COVID? So um, the Manchester briefing is available and you can sign up using the link on the previous slide. 
The document contains, um, at the moment, contains six um, clauses, main clauses, and I'm going to very quickly over the next um, 18 minutes or so take you through um, these clauses and try just to give you a sense as to what we mean by recovery, what we mean by renewal, and how those can be thought about in more detail. Next slide, please. So, we started off at the very beginning of thinking about recovery. We were sitting in many recovery coordination group meetings. These are the meetings that are organized at a local authority, local resilience forum level. And they're thinking about how do we recover our area? How do we recover the people, the places, the processes in our area? And they were struggling with this term recovery because we realised that recovery, whilst as the definition on the screen suggests, the process of rebuilding, restoring, rehabilitating the community following an emergency, that was insufficient for what the opportunity that COVID presented. So lots of people were talking about functional recovery or rebuild or restart or we came down on renewal because we think that renewal is positive. And whilst recovery is about perhaps looking back and thinking about what we need to put back in, uh, in correct order, renewal is much more ambitious than that, much more positive than that. So ISO 22393 focuses on recovery in terms of looking back and renewal in terms of looking very far forward and thinking about what recovery and renewal actually means. So next slide, please. So some of the concepts that we're trying to go over in the standard is this difference between recovery and renewal. So in recovery, we think that organisations need to renovate their services. So COVID has identified for us some vulnerabilities in services, um, some ways in which services weren't having the value that we thought that they were having. And so those services can be renovated. They can be changed and improved so that the customer, so that the recipient, the beneficiary um, receives a better service in a, context, uh, in a, in a COVID environment. We think that recovery also involves reviewing learning. So what's happened over the last few months? What learning is there? How can we learn from that experience and use that to move ahead and to, um, to make sure that whatever our, our service or operations are, that they are done in an enhanced way, more effectively, um, with better preparations um, and, and more COVID safe environment. And the third part to recovery, we think, is about reinstating resilience, making sure that the organisation is able to continue for the long term, making sure that the, the parts um, are in place, whether that's having sufficient PPE, whether it's understanding this new marketplace, whether it's um, having in place the right skills, the right people, this whatever digital infrastructure you need, but making sure that the organization can continue to offer its services so that it's resilient in that sense. And I know that Rick is going to talk a lot more about this. So um, I'll let him talk about that as his areas of expertise. So we see recovery as being relatively short term to, to identify and address these fragilities that COVID has exposed. And we realize that these are potentially relatively transactional recovery actions. So this is not about taking a long-term view of the organization. It's very much about getting the organization back up and running. However, there is also that long-term opportunity that COVID has presented, and we see that under renewal. And here, renewal is about reflecting on what's happening or what's happened and thinking about it very strategically, putting in place the partnerships and the, the negotiated settlements that need to be there so that you can renew your organisations. So thinking five, ten years in the future, thinking about what are the very complex activities that you now want to address and pro progressing in a strategic developmental process to try and achieve that. So this is about transforming your businesses. This is about looking at activity in a completely different way, requiring perhaps new partnerships, multiple partnerships. But as I say, it's much more ambitious and it's much longer term than recovery is. So next slide, please. So what we're trying to do is get um, people, organisations to think about three strands of recovery because we're going to have to recover our people whether that's our staff, whether it's our support key workers, vulnerable people, homeless, whether it's you as a manager, 
and having to operate and work with um, your staff in different ways and having different sorts of performance measures, different ways of um, different um, activities that you're having to address. So people need to be recovered. And so people work in places, they work in particular environments. Everybody's at the moment, many people's offices are their homes, many school rooms used to be um, our dining rooms. And so places have changed, the infrastructure's changed and the way in which we interact with infrastructure's changed. So the way in which we use hospitals, the way in which we um, use transportation, public transport systems, these things have changed. And so we need to think about how to recover and renew places and how people interact in those places. We also need to rethink processes. So the ways of working, the rules, the, the legislation that we have that we're all being, um, or we're all living within at the moment. So we very much put people at the forefront because people live in places and are supported by processes. It's not about putting um, economy at the front because it economy, in our view, work for people. It's putting people at the front of this and trying to understand how people have been impacted and how we can recover and renew people, supporting them with places and processes. Click on please, Dave. But realizing that these three aspects are all underpinned by power and by partnerships. So there is a tremendous amount of power that is currently being shifting. And we can see that um, as we watch the news and so forth. But we can see the power of people as well and the power of politicians and different, um, different ways in which power is being exercised. But also we have come to understand the, the new importance of partnerships, the relationships that underpin recovery and renewal and how those have changed recently. Some of them have expanded, some of them have concentrated on a smaller subset of previous partners, but they all form or, or all rely on trust. And how can we have trust going forward in recovery and renewal it seems to be a very big issue. Next slide, please. So what this standard talks about is these five blocks that you can see in the screen here. How do we set up a recovery coordinating group? That group that within your organization is going to think about the recovery and renewal of the organization. So how do you set up that group? And it may be that you have particular membership, roles and responsibilities, terms of reference, agreeing common aims. But the standard addresses um, that initiation of the recovery coordinating group. One of the first tasks of the RCG is to assess impacts. And so it's how does the RCG begin to assess those impacts? And I'll talk about that a little bit later on. How does RCG identify recovery strategies to address those impacts? How does RCG develop and promote a, a renewal summit, um, which is the forum that um, through which we think renewal can be facilitated? And then how can RCG monitor the implementation of these actions? So this is very much the blueprint of the standard as it is currently conceived. Next slide, please, Dave. So one of the first tasks that RCG has to address is to conduct an impact assessment. And this is about understanding why was, um, sorry, where did the impacts occur? How has COVID have these effects? And what we've been encouraging local governments to do is to think about six sort of effects. So the effects on humanitarian assistance that they've been providing, effect on economy, effect on infrastructure, environment, communications, and government legislation. So whilst we have been conducting the Manchester briefing that I mentioned at the very beginning, we've been thinking about all of the lessons that we've got and they all fit underneath these 38 subtopics, which means that we've got quite a wealth of information as to how can you recover, for example, vulnerable people or economic strategy or infrastructure providers and the, these are places where impacts have been felt. And so RCG can go out to these communities, out to these groups and ask them about what those impacts have been in the beginning stages of developing a recovery strategy. So next slide, please, Dave. So whilst RCG, 
Thank you, Dave. So whilst RCG can conduct this impact assessment, the aim is really to understand how people, places and processes have been infected and impacted by COVID. What are the significant impacts that have happened? If you ask for every impact, you'll quickly become absolutely overwhelmed. But we think if we focus on the significant impacts, understand what are, have been the effects, the impacts, the opportunities that, have, that COVID has created, then you can start putting together a recovery um, plan for short term recovery and a renewal strategy for that longer term um, effort. Next slide, please, Dave. So the fourth part of the guidance is looking at that recovery plan and thinking about, um, well, obviously everybody on the call knows how to develop a plan, but thinking about recovery in terms of six areas. So functional recovery, this is looking at um, the ways in which we need to renovate services, we need to take learning that we have and build that into that renovation, and we need to reinstate resilience or readiness for what's coming ahead. The recovery plan also needs to think about needs. So what are the needs that have emerged in the community or emerged in the organisation that perhaps were not realised previously? Thinking about communication and thinking about the importance of that and thinking about how information flows across the organisation and out into community, into suppliers or into customers. Thinking about the ambition for renewal, maybe not um, specifying what those actions or strategies should be, but thinking about what is it that we want to achieve in a longer term sense as a together as a partnership. Thinking about how do you exit recovery? So getting into recovery is all very important, but how do you move between recovery, perhaps back into response as we see outbreaks happening? How does recovery begin to move into business as usual activities as well? And so it's really trying to bring together all of this information in a recovery plan um, to scope out what the next three, five, six months looks like. Next slide, please. Then we have the much longer term piece. What does the next 12 months, two years, 10 years look like? And here we're looking at these big, ambitious, challenging um, challenge, challenges that um, organisations might want to pursue. Really things that they've always wanted to do that they've never really been able to position themselves well to do before. So the beginning of the renewal um, activities, having time to think, to negotiate, to align different stakeholders around these big challenges. And we think a, sum a summit is one way of doing that. You'll notice that the, the UN SDGs graphic is on the slide there, and it's for local government or national government, it's addressing some of these big challenges of you know, how do we um, address climate change through the actions that we're wanting to um, implement? How do we deal with some of the crippling inequalities that we see through the imbalance and gender imbalances that we see in our society, through BAME matters and, and integrating uh, all of society perspective into the way in which the country works for uh, and should work for everybody. So here it's about bringing together people who are able to facilitate and think about these sorts of challenges to agree a positive direction for change. There is very little perhaps that is positive that will come out of COVID. But what we're saying is that renewal is potentially one of those things. And because of that, it's important to perhaps leave COVID behind. So renewal is not about tying it all to COVID because there'll be a huge fatigue around COVID and people become very frustrated still listening to COVID um, five years after it will hopefully be over. So we need to align renewal with something that's much more positive, something that's much more optimistic, much more ambitious, um, and really taking the organisation, government, the country forward. But we do realise that this is done with what we call five tracks of pressure. So this is trying to do renewal at the same time as thinking about response and thinking about the way in which we've got to respond, recover, renew, and the politics that we've seen and the funding challenges and the global challenges that we're going to be um, potentially experiencing over the next few weeks and months and years. Next slide, please, Dave. So 
Um, we're also saying that um, there is a continuous improvement part to the standard. Obviously, that's very important in all standards that we continually reflect on practice and we bring practices in. And what we're saying to organisations is look outside, not just outside your immediate organisation, your sector, your, but look outside the country, look outside and see what else is happening. And the Manchester briefing is one place to get those lessons and there's lots of places at the moment, but find out where these lessons are and bring them into your organization and be inspired by them. Because no matter what's happening in your organization, there'll be other partners in Colombia or Germany or Denmark or wherever who are experiencing similar things and you can perhaps get a bit of inspiration from them. Next slide, please, Dave. So that is the standard, it takes us through these um, six sections in the main and really trying to encourage organisations to take a very strategic approach to recovery and renewal. Obviously, it would be very easy just to integrate um, COVID into our business as usual and to continue the operating the organisation like we've always done. But we're suggesting that now is an opportunity for many organisations to take a step back and to rethink the way in which they do business, the way in which they're satisfying and supporting customers and integrating with suppliers, and really taking a completely fresh perspective on how they can do that. Next slide, please, Dave. So I'd like to thank you very much for listening. Um, and um, I would like to uh, hand over the presentation or the time to Rick, who's going to talk us to us a little bit about organizational resilience. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, Duncan. And um, many of the themes you touched on there obviously are also highly relevant to organisations as they seek to strengthen and build resilience. Um, as Dave mentioned, I think at the outset of these presentations, um, BS 65000, which is the uh, British standard on organisational resilience, is um, just started. It's in the initial stages of a sort of major revision. Um, and there's a, a great team of experts involved in, in taking that forward. What I don't want to do is sort of preempt exactly where that standard will go uh, as we look forwards, because we're only at the beginning stages. But I thought what I'd do is just share some thoughts that I've developed alongside my colleagues here in Deloitte around organisational resilience uh, and, and what it means. So next slide, please, Dave. Dave. So in September this year, um, we launched a campaign at Deloitte titled Resilience Reimagined. And um, we did this for a number of reasons, but primarily many of the businesses that we were speaking to were saying, you know, resilience has now become a strategic issue uh, for them. And yet when we asked them, you know, what do they mean by being more resilient? Um, we found there were sort of many different views uh, very few clear ideas on how to address the issue as well. Um, it's uh, in, in our view, it's an often overused word. And for, for many organizations, I think um, they, they struggle to therefore achieve sort of tangible action. And they typically lose momentum fairly soon after they uh, got their initial enthusiasm uh, as other priorities kick in. So our point of view here is, this is just a, a, a synopsis of a longer blog, which is on our website. Um, and that, that also has its more insight and themes on resilience across various industries. But it, it summarizes some of our perspectives on resilience. And our, our aim here, as I say, is to bring uh, greater clarity on what resilience means for an organization and what can and should be done to improve resilience in practice. So we've we, we launched this campaign um, not just in response to the uh, impact of COVID-19 or indeed EU exit uh, here in the UK, but because we think organisations fundamentally do need to rethink what being resilient really means um, for them and, and what they should do. Uh, and interestingly, I think we're seeing more research coming out as well, which suggests a more resilient organisation outperforms a less resilient organization, not just in sort of periods of crisis, uh, where that outperformance can be quite substantial, um, uh, 20, 30 percent in some, uh, some estimates in terms of outperformance, but they also typically outperform less resilient organizations in normal times. 
So there's a real indication that more resilient organizations um, thrive in, in normal conditions as well as in crisis conditions. And, you know, I think of one thing we can be certain, there's going to be more disruption and shocks facing, uh, facing us all uh, in the future. So build, building resilience, and I think Duncan ca uh, covered this as well, building resilience should, should not simply be seen as a response to COVID-19 and addressing the lessons that we may have learned from this, but it should be seen as well as part of creating a long-term success for the future. Uh, so that's really where we're, we're heading. So go to the next slide, Dave. One of the things we've put out there under Resilience Reimagined is a framework for organizational resilience. And there's three parts to this framework. The, the first part on the left-hand side is what we term as the resilience mindset. So for an organization to become more resilient, it has to have the fundamental mindset where it's asking the questions, what if? Uh, so what if this risk materializes, then what? Uh, but also uh, the mindset to ask the question, what next? And I don't mean just what's the next risk we need to be concerned about, but I also mean what's the next opportunity in terms of, you know, how is the market changing? You know, how are, are the uh, political econ economic uh, situation changing, et cetera? But where, where is, the, what's the next uh, opportunity for, for the organization? So they've got to have, I think, as a fundamental um, uh, prerequisite for organizational resilience, the right mindset established from the top and through the organization. The second uh, part of this framework uh, talks about the resilience life cycle. And in here we say there's a, a life cycle of resilience by design, resilience through change and resilience in adversity. Um, by resilience by design, I mean, you know, resilience is a conscious set of decisions that you take to build. It is not something that you're going to achieve uh, without that um, directional uh, uh, statement of intent, um, which is then seen through the decisions you make on a day-to-day -day basis. So resilience fundamentally can only be achieved by design. Uh, secondly, we're saying if you build resilience by design, you need to safeguard it and enhance it through change. So as you make changes, then is your opportunity to uh, reinvigorate resilience, uh, certainly to ensure that you don't undermine the resilience you've already built into the organization. And then the, th the third part of this is having built resilience by design and safeguarded it through change, you have to obviously demonstrate resilience in adversity. So when crisis conditions occur, you need to be able to demonstrate that you have the resilience capabilities in place and that you have the sort of crisis management and response capabilities to make the sort of decisions uh, and, organ and organize yourselves to respond effectively. So those are the life cycle points we talk about. And then uh, the third part of this um, framework is recognizing that for an organization to be truly resilient, it needs to have strong pillars in three areas. The first one is uh, financial resilience. It needs to have strength, uh, both in terms of its balance sheet, but also in terms of its access to cash, its liquidity. So financial resilience is a fundamental uh, aspect of an organization's resilience. The second pillar is its operational resilience. Uh, and by that, we mean all um, non-financial resources. So its people, workforce, its, um, its uh, uh, locations of work, uh, its supply chain, its um, outsource or third parties that support it, but basically how the organization has been set up to operate. And then the third uh, pillar of resilience for an organization is its reputational resilience. Uh, so that is about the perceptions of its stakeholders, whether those are its employees who you you need to um, support the organization during times of adversity, whether it's its investors who you might need to uh, seek additional funds from, whether it's regulators or politicians or whatever. So those three pillars all reinforce each other and to be uh, organizationally resilient, all three pillars need to be, be strong. Uh, next slide. Okay. So that just brings me to uh, touch on 
the sort of characteristics, you know, what, what makes an organization more or less resilient. And again, I think there's some growing convergence on the defining characteristics of a more resilient organization. Um, I, I led a recent forum, there were over 80 chief risk officers in there. Uh, and in that forum, I set out eight characteristics, um, such as resourcefulness, uh, redundancy, uh, diversity, uh, adaptive capacity, leadership, etc. And in a, a live poll of those chief risk officers, I asked them to choose what they thought are the top three characteristics displayed by their organization during the course of the pandemic so far. Um, and not too surprisingly to me, but the top three characteristics uh, that these 80 chief risk officers set out were firstly, leadership, secondly, adaptive capacity, and thirdly, resourcefulness. The bottom two, interestingly, were uh, redundancy and diversity. So, in other words, many organizations have had to rely on leadership, adaptive capacity, and resourcefulness to see them through this, to underpin their response to, to COVID-19. I mean, and in, in many ways, that's a good thing. Uh, it's a strength that uh, you know, is, is certainly worth having and needs to be developed and, and, and locked in to, to the uh, resilience of an organization. But I think it's also notable that the bottom two, redundancy and diversity, were you know, not so evident. And I think the result is that organizations have often had to compensate for weaknesses in resilience in these uh, two characteristics by showing strength in leadership and adaptive capacity, et cetera. So, you know, if we think about that, what makes an organization more resilient and what are the characteristics and capabilities you need to build in by design and safeguard through change and demonstrate an adversity? Well, on this slide, firstly, let me come to um, our definition of a resilient organization. We're saying that a resilient organization is able to th thrive before, during, and after adversity. So it can survive throughout that life cycle. And if we, if we look then at the characteristics, uh, if we consider before adversity, uh, one thing, the things we see are um, more resilient organizations clearly anticipate events early on, and they foresee how things might play out. They do what uh, the government would term here as reasonable worst case scenario planning. They create, as a result, options either for dealing with the situation or for making changes to how they're going to operate so it's more resilient. And as a result, they are better prepared. So, you know, a common example of this might be, um, say, you know, power network companies, when they see severe weather approaching, they would forward move assets and engineers to the appropriate areas so they're ready to, uh, to respond to any uh, disruption in power supply. During um, adversity, um, because those organizations are better prepared and have already made the organization more resilient to the situations they may face, they've got the uh, buffers to um, absorb a shock better. Uh, and this apply, again applies to all three pillars that I mentioned in finance and operations and reputation. Uh, we've seen through COVID-19 how the initial shock was to the operations of a business, uh, uh, but they can be buffered by a rapid transfer to home working for some organizations. But we've also seen how the financial strength, liquidity has helped to see firms through some of those operational challenges and how their reputational resilience has helped firms seek either additional finance from the markets where needed, or attract loyal customers back when they've been able to reopen. So these things, as I say, do reinforce themselves. We've also seen the crucial adaptive capacity at play across many organizations. Um, for example, restaurants moving to home delivery, for example. And some of these changes will no doubt be adopted or adapted as part of their long-term success in the future. So they'll become part of the way they operate in their business model going forwards. And then just finally, after adversity, what we see is the more resilient organizations will have ridden the storm better. So they typically come out of uh, 
a crisis situation more confident in their resilience and therefore more willing to take risks. And because they continue to have stronger financial and operational resilience, they are able to invest uh, better to shape the future. Um, and again, you know, if we think about perhaps Volkswagen, maybe an example of this, um, where they suffered a major reputational shock, uh, they had the financial and the operational strength to reset their strategy and, you know, are, are clearly seeking to become a leader in electric vehicles. So just to con conclude, I think from our perspective, this is a really important time and a golden opportunity to address resilience. Uh, whether that's in a programmatic way by looking at each of the three pillars, identifying the sort of vulnerabilities and addressing each of those, or just simply by ensuring resilience is an overarching theme within any sort of change and transformational programs that organizations are undertaking, whether that's about how they're looking at the future of work or digitization or changes to the supply chain. Um, it's a, a significant and great opportunity to build resilience in to those changes by design. So just to uh, uh, complete then, so, you know, we've, we've set out a, a framework and a life cycle I've talked through in this, with the three pillars. Uh, we're setting out some of the characteristics we think are, are very important here for a resilient organization. And those characteristics span sort of before, during and after adversity. So with that, I'll, uh, Dave, I'll hand back to you for any Q&A. Thank you. Thanks, Rick. And thanks, Duncan, to you both. And uh, right on time as well, so I appreciate that. Uh, so Q&A, uh, chaps, you can see the Q&A, but one of the questions that um, I've got for you both is what does, well, the question reads, what does recovery and renewal look like for community resilience? Rick, we can uh, add that for you and we'll call that organizational resilience. Mm -hmm. I can modify that question. What is good? Let's add good in front of it. So what is successful or good recovery and renewal look like? Because obviously it could go pear-shaped the whole thing. Fortunately, that probably will happen in a lot of instances. But what does good recovery and renewal look like, uh, Duncan, for community resilience, please? Okay, thanks, Dave. Um, well, I think before COVID, we had lots of questions about community resilience. We thought that communities would um, come to help, but we weren't quite sure how many would come and what they would be able to do. We weren't quite sure about their understanding of risk and weren't quite sure whether we could rely on them. So there was a lot of questions around community resilience, which meant that they were a risk. And during COVID, some of those questions were answered. We've seen almost the communities being a new national capability from the invisible acts of good neighborliness that we see across our streets or large and small organizations making huge donations or providing support in ways that they've never done before. So really COVID has proved that there is resilience there within our community. And the task now is about making sure that we don't lose that. So whilst previously community resilience, it felt like it was a huge mountain to climb because the task was about changing mindsets. It was about trying to get people to understand the importance, potential importance of community resilience. Now the task is about maintaining, refining and embedding this new mindset that we've got, that communities are there, that they can provide the sort of support that we've seen in the outpouring during COVID. We need to understand how communities can work alongside other parts of the emergency response or other parts of um, other types of response. Um, we need to think about um, some of the clarity that we've had during COVID and how we can make use of that in our um, normal business as usual activities. So for example, um, COVID has really helped us to pinpoint who is vulnerable. It's helped us to pinpoint which communities and where communities can respond and how they can respond. And it's helped us to understand that communities understand more about local vulnerabilities than perhaps other parts of government. And therefore communities with that understanding can both communicate that understanding to government, but also can address that need as they find it. So there's a whole new opportunity for community resilience, but really 
it all boils down to community resilience helping to, to reduce the severity of impacts from a crisis or an emergency, to reduce the likelihood of crises having impacts and to enhance preparedness. So in terms of where will community resilience or recovery renewal of that be going, hopefully it will be going into lo every local authority, every organisation, every household, this is the ambition, um, and and communicating to them that they are part of the solution. And together we will be able to respond more effectively, but not to forget the vast progress that we've made over the last six, eight months. Okay, thank you, Duncan. We have just a, a minute left, uh, Rick. Uh, so Sorry, same thing for you, please, if you can. Yeah, very quick, very quickly then, Dave. Just uh, two thoughts from me on, on organization. So first, you know, recovery and renewal. Recovery to me does not mean, you know, go back to what we did. Uh, renewal is about looking to the future and, and doing things differently. Two great examples. When we had the financial crisis, the financial services, right, took significant steps to revamp and, and set out a much stronger um, uh, financial resilience um, position for the future. Uh, secondly, I mentioned Volkswagen in my um, uh, uh, talk there. You know, they, after, the, uh, after the scandal that they, they had of impact in their reputation, they didn't just go back to building the same cars that they've built before. They set out an entirely new strategy focused on electric. Uh, so I think resilient organizations look to thrive in the future by shaping a forwards direction, uh, not just recovering back to where they've come from. Thank you both so much. Listen, we had uh, a few un unanswered questions and I, I know the raised hands thing, this is a, another hint for going forward to the other sessions. Please don't raise your hand, but put them through the Q&A. So we're gonna end it there so that we give the time uh, that uh, I think Sally's next. And again, Rick Cudworth and um, Duncan Shaw, thank you so much. And thank you for making those questions. Those will be answered following the, the, the session and following the meeting. We're gonna end it there, appreciate it. See, I was assuming we were going to get uh, rushed off the off the show here, but it seems that there's a there's a little bit of a silence there. Perhaps for, are we still live? <laughs> but uh, maybe we can kind of talk yes. all those subjects. I had I had another number number of questions there to put, but uh, you are still live, actually. And if sorry, it's Stephanie. Sorry to to barge right in. I've been listening. Very interesting. Um, <laughs> Uh, you can still take a few more questions if if you've got time. Let me just double check. I think the next session. I think we're out of time. I think. I think yeah. I, I haven't committed the agenda to memory. I apologize. You would think I had. Um, cool. Yes, you've 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 still got some time. If you want to field a couple more questions, that would be absolutely fine. Okay, lovely. How much time do we have? You've got until, well, if you want to take it right down to the wire until half past two, let's, oh, call, oh, it, let's oh. call it 2.29. <laughs> okay, lovely. We'll crack on then. Okay, so um, that, that was an interesting, um, then I'm um, glad I didn't uh, close down here. Okay, one of the questions that Paul Robbins has put to us, thanks Paul for this, should changes to resources and key activities as part of processes be included in these standards? Now, again, if I can modify that qu question slightly. So he's wanting to know, should changes to resources and key activities as part of processes be included in these standards? Let's assume yes, but if, no, if not. But if so, what key activities? Um, let's start with Rick first. Yeah, this is a challenging one, I think. You know, I, I did talk about resilience through change. And I think, you know, if, if I think about that theme, certainly one of the angles we're absolutely thinking about here is when you make change um, does that change in effect make you more or less resilient and if to make you more resilient you know clearly then we are thinking about what are the resources or the activities or the processes uh, that support that and why are you know why does that make you more resilient so I think um, Paul you're absolutely right in the, in the question the standards should be explicit about um, those areas um, and, and the thinking that's needed through change activities. Because we often see you know, really good intent from organizations, they build resilience at a point in time, and then it rapidly gets undone as you know, they seek uh, efficiency or cost savings, uh, they, they 
then start to build, but if you like, single points of failure within their organization, um, often unconsciously uh, without thinking about the resilience uh, when they do that. Okay, Duncan, um, it's sort of same question to you, but one thing I had to point out that I thought was interesting that you highlighted about recovery aspect, one of the strands was review the learning. Uh, so the question, sorry, was, was uh, what should changes to resources and key activities? Well, see, assuming that re learning and the review of learning, uh, that's quite an important uh, part of continual um, improvement anyway in management systems. Uh, how are you sort of tackling that in your, your research to date? And how are you going to go forward with that as, as a key activity, this renewal of, of learning? Okay, thanks, Dave. So um, we're looking at learning as thinking about what was the effectiveness of the response against five different criteria almost? So we take a, a systems approach and using systems theory, um, there is a particular theory called viable systems modeling. And that says that for every viable organization, you need to have five things that are all operating in balance with one another and all pointing in the same direction. And so you've got to have a, a vision, a strategy that's clearly understood by the organization. You need to have intelligence coming into the organization from outside. So knowledge about what's gonna happen, what's coming around the corner and what is other competitors doing about it. You need to have your management systems in place and they need to be able to control and monitor the delivery of your organizational output. You need to coordinate um, the different resources that you've got and ultimately you need to deliver for customers or deliver from beneficiaries of your services. So these five things need to be looked at and what we're suggesting is that because COVID has stretched into every part of operations within government, within organizations, is because of that systems view, we need to take a systems approach to learning lessons. So we can learn lessons against these five systems. And we have um, developed this into ISO 22392, um, which is a peer review standard. Um, so it looks at peer review of local government entities. And in there, you'll see 19 questions that are structured against these five, um, these five systems. And that's the way that we're going to be starting to look at learning from COVID. Okay, thanks. Uh, Paul Robbins has just put in an interesting one. Uh, leaders have failed to prepare in the past with GFC and SSRs. Uh, what will help in future leaders to prepare for crises? Okay, so that, that's a wonderful question. Um, and because we have a new standard coming out on, on uh, crisis management. So uh, Duncan and um, Rick, I'll give you just a, a moment uh, to prepare for your answer for that. But if I may, in the UK, the cabinet office championed this subject area crisis management with PAS 200, then 11200, then went to Europe 17091. We're currently doing it. It's out uh, for public uh, consultation uh, next year in quarter one please be on the lookout for it. It's crisis management, but it has a wonderful track record and uh, has proved a very valuable for organizations that have used it. The number is 22361, not to be confused with 22316, which is the organizational <laughs> resilience. Uh, so just uh, those two last numbers, the 22361 is crisis management. Very, very good read and, and well received by the uh, market. Okay, so Paul Robbins' question, leaders have failed to prepare in the past with the GFC and SARS, what will help in future leaders to prepare for crises? Uh, let's start off with uh, Duncan this time. Sure. Well, I guess the way I would answer this is that um, what we've seen in local government is that they prepare generic capabilities. So within the UK's emergency response um, sector, they have a suite of generic capabilities that can be, um, that, that span across different types of crises or emergencies. So no matter how an emergency lands, you have these generic capabilities that are able to be drawn upon in order to respond. So we've seen, um, so mass evacuation is an example of that. Mass fatalities is another example. And we've seen these two um, capabilities being exercised during COVID and during the response to COVID. So leaders have um, prepared 
um, genetic capabilities to be able to respond to this crisis. It's absolutely true that there might not have been um, the response to a COVID a coronavirus pandemic, but those generic capabilities are there and are able to influence, uh, inform, to be able to underpin a response, no matter, because that's that's ultimately what the UK is preparing for, an emergency, no matter how it lands, because although you may prepare for a flood, the flood may not happen exactly when, where, and how you expected it to, and so these generic capabilities are there to pick up and to provide support, no matter what happens. Great, great. Yeah, and I think um, there's a, there's always been this dichotomy for organisations. You know, resilience has seemed to cost money. Um, there's been typically a sort of more short short termism view, and you know, how do we save money rather than, than spend more? So I think this has been, been the challenge. Again, one of the things we're trying to do here is set out that actually resilience is increasingly now a strategic issue for mm. for organisations and. As a strategic issue, it's actually about securing the long-term success of an organization. And I sort of pointed to some of the research that shows firms that have invested in resilience don't just do better in times of crisis. Actually, they do better in everyday situations as well. Uh, And the more that I think organizations see um, being more resilient is a benefit in their day-to-day ways of working because it gives them more flexibility. It gives them the adaptive capacity to change, to changing circumstances. It brings a lot of those sort of characteristics into everyday uh, ways of working. I think, you know, perhaps they're, they're more likely to, to look at the uh, trade-off better between resilience and, and efficiency. And, you know, one of the things we would talk about is if you look at high reliability organizations, they are better able to do that trade-off because they put reliability as the fundamental principle on which they're operating. So when they're looking at changes or building resilience, they're going, you know, is this design going to leave me, you know, is it it going to um, create a reliable position? It's not about just creating the most efficient. It's the balance between creating a reliable uh, system, which is also efficient, but fundamentally it must be reliable first. Mm-hmm. Right. Thank you. So David Matthews has written, no, uh, Rick and Duncan, I'm not sure if you've read this comment. I believe it was certainly made during your presentation, Duncan, but he says, of course, funding is a key facet, bringing together those who do not receive support or are from a diverse sector can little afford involving themselves. So financially, now, now just to add to that, as I've been doing, hope that hasn't been an irritant, but um, Duncan, the Manchester briefings, uh, but take, taking David Matthews' point that, you know, it, it, for some people it is difficult. Funding is, of, of, is, is important and it, it has to do with whether you can get involved or not in a lot of instances. But Duncan, if I can add, ask you to respond to that question, but also bring in your Manchester briefings. Tell, me, tell us how that went, because that was kind of fascinating and actually led in some degree to 223 Non three, hasn't it? Please. Yeah, so uh, I, can, I agree with um, David Matthews that funding is just so key. Um, what we're saying is that during COVID, we've seen many organisations or government um, stopping doing activities beco- and In stopping doing those activities, in order to focus on some other activities, they've begun to understand the value of activities. So some activities that were stopped, maybe people haven't noticed that they've stopped, they haven't missed those activities. And so those activities were not having the value that they thought it was previously happening. So that's maybe something you can look at going forward in terms of how do you um, stop doing things. This was a lesson that we heard from Hamburg Fire, no, sorry, not Hamburg, um, it was a fire brigade in Germany, um, and they were talking to us in detail um, during the interviews that we were doing for the Manchester briefing about the sorts of activities that they were stopping doing and how they were taking more of a community-centric approach. Um, so you can stop doing things, but obviously at the moment there's an awful lot of um, potential funding out there for different organisations, different project-based funding. One of the things we saw in Denmark was local authorities bringing together small organisations from the local areas and talking to them about um, doing construction work, about supporting the activities that their local government were having to do. 
So here it wasn't about going to um, large multinational organisations. It was very much about keeping it local and having town hall meetings and trying to push money into the local economy. Um, so what we do through the briefing is, is learn lessons like all of these things and, and um, look at large funding um, activities that are happening, looking at small initiatives that are happening at, happening at uh, community levels and try and bring these together for local authorities to be inspired by them and to um, potentially implement as a way of supporting people out of the COVID situation. Yeah, now forgive me, I, mean, I think you've already said, is that available to the public? To Yes, yeah, available free um, from the university. So I can put the... Um, you had it in one of your slides, didn't you? I did, yes. Yeah, and when it got lost and all that, maybe you could throw it and put it on the chat now, because sure. the thing about the chat is, guys, um, I see there's a number of chat messages, and uh, I did mention that I wouldn't really be looking at it, so hopefully there's no questions there, and if there are, forgive me, we won't be addressing those. But there's one from Peter uh, Hebert. He says, an engineer who has not only founded our COVID task force, but has advised the government on how to mobilize communities to help themselves be at floods, uh, sea level rise or economic regeneration. The key is to warn people what happened uh, and maybe it's not what you read, but, but also what they could. I'm sorry, Peter, you know what that, that um, uh, somehow that's been cut off that uh, the rest of that uh, uh, comment that you've made there or whether it was a question, well, my apologies for that. But otherwise, I think, I think we were out of time now and, and it was really great. So. Duncan and Rick, thank you. And for those people who've asked the questions and chatted, uh, appreciate it. Uh, made a, a very interesting session. Thank you.